Today, we're in Seattle, Washington, where last night I addressed the closing session of the International Christian Leadership World Convention. This is the organization that sponsors the President's Prayer Breakfast each year in Washington, D.C., and also sponsors the Governor's Prayer Breakfast in almost every state in America and many such breakfasts and conferences all over the world. Hundreds of world leaders are here to pray and plan together for a worldwide revival and witness for Christ. This afternoon, we will have a great public service in the new Seattle Coliseum. And then we will be in Portland, Oregon for meetings early this week. On August the 27th, the Denver Crusade begins. We would appreciate your prayers for the preparations that are being made. And if you can, come to Denver late in August and join us in that great crusade. This past week, the newspapers have been filled with stories of riots, demonstrations, and various kinds of picketing throughout the country. The United States is rapidly becoming a nation of picketers, demonstrators, squatters, and sitters. What a spectacle we have become to the world. Small groups of people making headlines in the newspapers and getting their pictures on television because they're protesting something. This summer, I've even been to religious meetings which are picketed by other Christians because they did not believe in the particular doctrine of those holding the meetings. Where is all this going to end? This is freedom out of control. The Constitution allows people to assemble and petition the government, but certainly the framers of our Constitution never foresaw that this freedom would be used as it is being used today for every conceivable type of protest. Our newspapers have also been filled with the stories of crime that has gotten out of control in many sections of the country. The nation has been following the crime spree of two Oregon men here in the West during the last few days. We've also been following the Louisiana race problems with its hate and shootings on both sides. Many of our cities have become jungles that are ruled by the fang and claw. During this past week, scores of people have been murdered and literally thousands of robberies have taken place. Millions of Americans are now afraid to walk in their own neighborhoods at night. Fear now stalks the streets. A missionary, just having returned from Africa, said after being slugged on the head by a hoodlum, it is much safer in an African jungle than it is on an American street. Add all of this to the sexual immorality that is taking place this summer throughout the nation and you are witnessing a decaying society that is in for the judgment of God unless it repents of sin in the near future. The problem facing America and all countries at this hour is sin in the human heart. The Bible says that man is suffering from a spiritual disease called sin. We used to think that sin once done was done with. Now psychiatrists inform us that nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, psychologists are now agreeing with the Bible. Sin, when persisted in, etches its way into the unconscious, making scars that greatly affect our personalities and behavior for years to come. It taints and tarnishes every fiber of our being. No wonder Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived, said, fools make a mock of sin. We moderns have played the fool when it comes to the fact of sin. Thousands think of sin as no more than a name for the little slips and blunders on life's journey, with no more consequence than stubbing one's toe or tripping over a stick. But the Bible takes no such view of sin. It says the wages of sin is death. And this not only means death in this life, spiritual death, but it means death in the future, which Jesus described as hell. The stigma of death is upon every infraction of God's law. And it naturally follows that anyone who has a low view of sin has also a superficial view of the atonement of Christ and of eternity. That is why Satan, the enemy of men's soul, is so anxious to minimize sin in the eyes of people. He well knows that sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, judgment, and hell. And if he can get people to persist in sinning, laughing at sin, and taking it lightly, he will have gained a great victory and added to the population of hell. Job once made a startling statement regarding sin. He said, Thou makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Job 13, 26. This suggests to us that unrepented sins remain with us all the days of our life. 
They are like an inoperable cancer which persists despite all efforts to get rid of it. They become ingrained in our character, etched in the lines of our faces and detected in our very attitudes and behavior. Unless we allow God to forgive our sins and as he has said to cast them into the depths of the sea of forgetfulness, they will color everything we do, think and say. They are like a haunting echo and keep bouncing off the wall of the past distracting us, menacing us, and hindering us, and eventually leading us to hell. No wonder Job in his hour of great trial said, Thou makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. There are several ways that the sins of the past come back to haunt us. First, our sins come back to us as bitter memories. Who can forget the penetrating pain of anguish that Lady Macbeth experienced after she had committed the sin of murder? In the place, she held up her hands, looked at them with terror, and cried, Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not take it away. Oh, my hands, my hands! Such memories have driven men mad. Our sins, or so we think, are securely buried beneath the safety of the past. But unless they've been absolved by God, they keep coming back to memory and come to life again, especially in old age. How many old men in recent days have told me of the bitter memories that they have of the sins of their youth? Michael, in his novel, The Roadmaster, tells of an organ grinder who one day played for a small girl. After listening to the music, the little girl, instead of giving the man a coin, lifted up her little face to be kissed. Whereupon, the organ grinder slapped the little girl and angrily moved on. But months later, when he was hospitalized because of an accident, the memory of the little girl was constantly before him. In his sleepless hours, he could see the love light in her eyes and recall the cruel blow he had given her rather than the love she wanted. He determined that when he left the hospital, he would find the little girl and try to make up to her. He never found her. But the memory of that little girl changed his life. The author then says, that man saw a little child and looked into the face of God. So the memory of our sins can be put to good use if we are willing to turn from them and by God's grace to improve our manner of living by the help of God. We can come in repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ and we can get rid of that terrible burden of guilt complex that weighs us down at this moment because of the sins of the past. Secondly, our sins come back to us as hindrances to a full, rich, and happy life. Paul wrote, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. I know people who could have risen to the heights had it not been for sin in their lives. It is the great hindering force, the great deterrent to peace of heart and mind. How often we've heard such words as these. He could have been president of his firm if he hadn't loved liquor so much. Or he could have been the leader in his community if it hadn't been for his uncontrollable temper. Each of us has a tendency towards some overpowering, defeating, crippling sin. Paul said, let us lay aside every sin that doth so easily beset us. You know what sin is crippling you today. I don't have to tell you. You know what it is that is keeping you from becoming all that you should be and could be by the grace of God. Even some of God's greatest servants have had to pay for their past sins. The Bible contains an interesting passage. Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookst vengeance on their inventions. Moses, for his sin, had to be buried in a lonely grave at the very edge of the promised land. His past sins grew into a barrier that kept him from entering the land of milk and honey that he had worked so long and hard to enter. David, because of his sin, was refused permission to build God's temple. Though God had forgiven him, his sin kept him from fulfilling one of the great ambitions of his life. Remember this, sin is not just a little mistake that is quickly forgotten. Its scars can never be erased, and it hinders us from being the example and the influence we might have been for God. Thirdly, our sins come back to us as heavy burdens. Nothing can weigh on your conscience like a sin that is unconfessed and unforgiven. Watch the child in his adolescent years. His heart is light and gay. His eyes are full of wonder. Every day is a colossal, exciting experience. Then as the years roll on, that once carefree child begins to experiment with sin. The light leaves his eyes. The sense of joy and wonder is lost. And the excitement of life is gone. Sin places heavy burdens upon us. 
College life, at least when I went to school, was a happy life. Though we were not little angels by any means, our superiors were sufficiently concerned about our welfare that strict rules were imposed upon us. But we had our pranks, our practical jokes, and our fun. But we were happy, it seems, as I look back. But today, there's a different spirit on our campus. The old rules have been abolished. The sky's the limit. Youth today is free to do what they will. The Ten Commandments are antiquated and laughed at by professors. Sex promiscuity is common. Drinking is permitted. We are emancipated. But aren't free people supposed to be happy? However, on our campuses today, I hear little real laughter. I observe little real joy. Many young people seem like disillusioned old men and women, tired of living, fed up with it all, many of them trying even to commit suicide. Satan is still saying today, in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. But this freedom to do whatever we will, regardless of the consequences, never has brought peace and happiness and never will. Sin still imposes burdens upon men and women, still leads them out of paradise, and still separates them from God. Fourth, our sins come back to us as a motivation to seek God's grace. Perhaps we see a glimpse of why God permitted sin to enter the universe. A man will never search for food unless he's hungry. A man will never ask for water unless he is thirsty. Just so, a man will find no response to the grace of God unless he becomes conscious of the fact that he is a sinner. And it is the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. Before you come to Jesus Christ, you must know that you're a sinner. And it is the Holy Spirit's work to show you your sins. And after you see that you're a sinner, you go to the cross to find forgiveness. So sin with all of its power to embitter the memory, to hinder one's development, and to bring the burden of guilt to the soul, has perhaps, after all, a constructive use to point to our need of God. If we can say that good can come out of evil, then this is it. True, sin separates. That is what Satan intends it to do. But it also can overplay its hand and reveal our need of God. Isaiah was making spiritual progress when he cried in the temple, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. His consciousness of sin had brought him to the temple of God. And his repentance brought him to the God of the temple. For after God in his redeeming love took a coal from the altar and purged his unclean lips, Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Also was the case of the prodigal son, who had allowed sin to separate him from his loving father. Odd indeed that the sin that led him away also drove him back when he saw it for what it really was. Then having spent his all in riotous living, he came home in repentance saying, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. It was then that reconciliation came. At last he had gotten sin in the right perspective. He had clearly seen how it was devastating his life, leading to judgment and hell, and he was willing to do what must be done to regain that love, which meant more to him than all the cheap thrills of a sensual world. Yes, God can use the worst to make of us the best. Sin, when it becomes emptied of all its superficiality, can become a motive force to make us seek God's face. Thou makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth, but the sins of our youth need not possess us. God's word says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our only hope at this hour is in the merits of the shed blood of the Savior. The blood, the blood is all my plea. Hallelujah, for it cleanses me, says the hymn writer. All your sin has been laid on Christ. Acknowledge this. Trust in him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Your sins can be forgiven today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that as we come to thee in sincere repentance of sin, that thou wouldst forgive us by the grace of God in Christ at the cross. For we ask it in his name. Amen.